The SWOT analysis is a study undertaken by an organization to identify its internal strengths and weaknesses, as well as its external opportunities and threats. And it was designed by Albert Sir Humphrey way back in the 1960s. While it has a lot of limitations, the SWOT analysis is a great icebreaker and helps a team kick off strategy formulation before you get into a more detailed industry analysis such as the porters. It's a great way to assess the lay of the land, if you will. As we mentioned, a SWOT usually comprises of four quadrants. Uh, strengths are capabilities that enable your company to perform well. Weaknesses are characteristics that prohibit your company from performing well. Opportunities are any trends, forces, events, and ideas that could be important in the future of your company. And finally, threats are possible events or forces outside of the company's control that the company needs to still plan for. Strengths and weaknesses are internal to the company. Um, th that is what the company can control, whereas opportunities or threats are external and companies have less control over what happened to them in, in the eventuality of those events. Let's look at each of these quadrants in a little bit more detail. The strengths of a company could be skill, knowledge, experience, organizational resource, competitive capabilities, market advantages, and competitive assets. To analyze and determine strengths of your company, ask yourself, what advantages does my organization have? What do we do better than anyone else? Um, what's our unique or lowest cost resource that I can draw upon that others can't? That will let me uh, have higher margins. What do people in your market or in my market see as my strengths? What factors do I need to get the sale? And finally, what is my organization's unique selling proposition? USP. The second quadrant, weaknesses, could include a missing asset needed to compete more effectively, conditions that place the firm at a disadvantage, or when the company has competitive, unproven competitive liabilities, financial liabilities, or unproven abilities. To analyze weaknesses, um, the questions you can ask is, what can you improve? What should you avoid? Um, what are the people in your market likely to see as weaknesses in both your product and your manufacturing process? What factors lose you sales? Again, consider this from an internal and an external perspective. Do other people seem to perceive weaknesses that you don't see? Are your competitors doing any better than you? And while you do this, it's best to be realistic and face any unpleasant truths as soon as possible. The third quadrant are opportunities. Um, these are changes in the business environment that can create opportunities for your organization that you can exploit. As we mentioned earlier, opportunities are external to the company. To gain a competitive advantage over your peers, you need to ask yourself, what good opportunities can you spot? How fast can you spot them in that? Can you spot them faster than your competitors? And what interesting trends are you aware of? Opportunities can come from changes like new technologies that help you reach new customers, new funding streams that allow you to invest in better equipment, and, and most importantly, changing government policy that opens up whole new markets. Uh, finally, a trend that companies need to keep rest of all the time are changes in social patterns, population profiling, lifestyle changes that you have no control over that can pose massive opportunities for you to exploit. The next and the last quadrant of the SWOT are threats faced by a business. Threats are usually deregulation that exposes you to intensified competition, a shrinking market or increases, to in increases in interest rates, which can cause problems if your company is burdened by debt. Analyzing business threats is, is extremely important um, for planning and for budgeting purposes. The questions you ask are generally, what obstacles do you face? What are your competitors doing? Are quality standards or specifications for your job, products or services changing? And are you keeping ahead of those changes? Is changing technology threatening your position? Do you have a lot of bad debt or do you have cash flow problems? And could any of your weaknesses seriously threaten your business? Moving on to the next method of industry analysis, the PEST analysis, which is simple and yet widely used and is I think imperative when you do any sort of industry analysis or any sort of company analysis um, that will enable you to do a better fundamental analysis. The four quadrants are political, economic, sociocultural, and technological changes in the business environment. The PEST was developed by Harvard professor Francis Aguilia. He included a scanning tool called the ETPS in his 1967 book, Scanning the Business Environment. The name was later tweaked to create the current acronym 
pest. The pest analysis helps you understand the big picture, forces of change that you are exposed to and the opportunities that these, from this that you can exploit. Let's look at how you can use the pest analysis to understand and adapt your future business environment. The pest helps you shape what you're doing so that you work with change rather than against it. It helps you avoid starting projects that are likely to fail for reasons beyond your control. It can also help you break free of unconscious assumptions when you enter a new country, region or market because it helps you develop an objective view of this new environment. Political factors usually include questions like when is the country's next local, state or national elections? That's your first most important question. How can this any change in government make create change in government or regional policy? Who are the most likely contenders for power and what are their ethical stands? What are their views on business policy and on other policies that affect your organization? Depending on the country, how well developed are property rights and rule of law? How widespread is corruption and organized crime? Could any pending litigation or legislation or taxation changes affect your business, either positively or negatively? How will business regulation, along with any planned changes to it, affect your business? And is there a trend towards regulation or deregulation, privatization or nationalization? And if either case, how are these situations likely to change? And in the end, of course, how is any of this likely to affect you? Few more questions to ask are also with respect to companies. Um, how does the government approach corporate policy, corporate social responsibility, environmental issues, and customer protection legislation? What impact does this have or is, and is it likely to change? The final few questions are, what are the likely time scale of proposed legislative changes? Are there any other political factors that are likely to change? And do you need to hire a lobbyist to the government? The next, of course, we come to the E in pest analysis, economic factors. These are macroeconomic variables that play a huge role in the functioning of the global financial system. For example, a change in interest rates by the Federal Reserve has an immediate impact on stock markets around the world. To understand the economic variables at play, we need to ask ourselves how stable is the current economy? Is it growing, stagnating or declining? Are key exchange rates stable or do they tend to vary significantly? Then comes questions regarding customers and the consumer mentality of the country. Are customers' levels of disposable income rising or falling? And how is this likely to change in the next few years? What's the employment rate likely to be like? Um, is it a high unemployment rate? Will it be easy to build a skilled workforce? Or will it be expensive to hire skilled labor? Do consumers and businesses have easy access to credit? If not, how will this affect your organization? How is globalization affecting the economic environment? Are there any other economic factors you should consider? And then there are socio-cultural factors that impact business. And these are ones that m most businesses tend to miss, especially when they go into a new country. You ask yourself, what are the population's growth rate and age profile? Are generational shifts in attitude likely to affect what you're doing? And more importantly, how is this likely to change? What are your societies or the society of the country you're entering? Levels of health, education, social mobility, employment patterns, job market trends, and attitudes towards work that you can now observe. How are these changing and what impact does, will this have on your business? And are these different for different age groups? What social attitudes and social taboos can affect the functioning of your office? Um, have there been recent sociocultural changes that might affect the way people interact with each other? How do religious beliefs and lifestyle choices affect the population and your working environment and the culture of, the, of your own organization? Are any other sociocultural factors likely to drive change for your business? Finally, there's technology. Another, another key, something that companies are aware of increasingly these days, but companies seem to still miss. Ask yourself, are there any new technologies that you could be using? Are there any new technologies on the horizon that could radically affect your work and your industry? Do any of your competitors have access to new technology that could redefine their products? In which areas do governments and educational institutions focus their research? And is there anything you can do to take advantage of this? How have infrastructure changes affected work patterns? For, for example, 
does the new country that you're going into, do the, does the infrastructure impact remote working? Are there existing technological hubs that you could work in or learn from? And are there any other technological factors that you, could, you should consider, like robotics? To sum up, a pest analysis helps you to spot businesses or personal opportunities. It gives you advanced warning of significant threats and reveals the direction of change within your business and the political environment. In the next section of the module, we will learn how to identify key success factors that can make or break a business. Our approach to identifying key success factors and we have understood how to analyze an industry on the basis of the Porter's five forces of the pest and the SWOT is straightforward and common sense. To survive and prosper in an industry, a firm must meet two criteria. First, it must supply what customers want to buy, and second, it must survive their competition. So we start by asking two questions. What do our customers want, and what does the firm need to survive competition? To answer the first question, we need to look more closely at customers of the industry and view them not as a threat to profitability because of their buying power, but a raison d'etre of the industry and the underlying source of its profit. This requires us to inquire who are our customers? What are their needs? How do they choose between comp competing offerings? Once we recognize the basis of customer preferences, we can then identify the factors that confer success upon the individual firm. For example, if consumers choose supermarkets on the basis of price, then cost efficiency is the primary base for competitive advantage, and the key success factors are the determinants of inter-firm cost differentials. The second question requires that we examine the nature of competition in the industry. How intense is the competition and what are its key dimensions? For example, in the competitive airlines industry, it is not enough to offer low fares, convenience and safety. Survival requires sufficient financial strength to weather the intense price competition that accompanies cyclical downturns. Key success factors can also be identified through direct modeling of profitability. In the same way five forces analysis models determinants of industry level profitability, we can also model firm level profitability by identifying the drivers of a firm's relative profitability within an industry. We're pretty sure everyone has heard of the BCG matrix. What is it? The Boston Consulting Group matrix was developed by Bruce Henderson of the Boston Consulting Group in the early 1970s. According to this technique, businesses or products are classified as low performance or high performance. This depends on their market growth and the relative market share. The Boston Con Consulting Group's product portfolio matrix is designed to help with long-term strategic planning and help a business consider growth opportunities by reviewing its portfolio of products to decide where to invest, to discontinue, and where to develop products. The matrix is divided into four quadrants based on market growth and relative share of a company. Each quadrant is represented by a symbol. In the bottom, you have dogs. These are products with low growth or market share. At the top right, you have question marks or problem children, which are products in high growth markets with low market share. At the top left, you have stars. These are products in the high growth markets with high market share. Lastly, at the bottom left, you have cash cows. These are products in low growth markets with high market share. Let's begin with the dog. These are products with a low market share and a low growth rate. What do you do with such products? Well, you either kill them or phase them out. For example, in the automotive sector, when a car line ends, there's still a need for spare parts. As Saab ceased trading and producing new cars, a whole business emerged from providing Saab parts. Another dog was, of course, the Samsung watch. It was a low growth, it was a low market share product in a low growth rate. No one needed it at that point. At the top right, you have question marks or problem children. These are products with high growth markets and low market share. These products often require significant investment to push them into the star quadrant. It's recommended you divest such products. For example, Rovio, creators of the very successful Angry Birds game, has developed many other games you may not have heard of. Computer games companies often develop hundreds of games before gaining one successful game. It's not always easy to spot the, fu spot the future star, and this can result in potentially wasted funds. At the top left of the matrix, you have the stars. These are products with high growth markets with high market share. They generate more ROI than any other product category, and hence it's recommended that to prioritize such products. For example, Google Play is a question mark product for Google. 
Lastly, at the bottom left, you have cash cows. These are products in low growth markets with high market share. It's often recommended a company should invest more in such products. For example, the company Procter & Gamble, which manufactures Pampers nappies to Lynx deodorants, has often been described as a cash cow company. You, can never need, you, can, you don't ever not need diapers. Looking at the British retailer Marks & Spencer, they have a wide range of products and many different lines. We can identify every element of the BCG across their ranges. Stars, for instance, are M&S lingerie. M&S was known as the place for ladies' underwear at a time when choice was limited. In a multi-channel environment, M&S lingerie is still the UK's lead market leader with high growth and high market share. Question marks and problem children. M&S simply food. For years, M&S refused to consider food and today has over 400 simply food stores across the UK. While it's not a major supermarket, M&S Simply Food has a following which demonstrates high growth but low market share. Cash cows, M&A, M&S Classic Range. Low growth and high market share, the M&S Classic Range has strong supporters. Dogs, the M&S Autograph Range. A premium priced range of men's and women's clothing with low market share and low growth but yet not phased out. Although placed in the dog category, the premium pricing means that it makes a financial contribution to the company and they're not going to get rid of it anytime soon. The BCG matrix provides a framework for allocating resources among different business units and makes it possible for businesses to compare units at a glance. But the BCG matrix is not free from limitations, such as the fact that it classifies businesses as low and high, but generally businesses can be also medium, thus the true nature of a business might not be reflected. Markets are not clearly defined in this model. High market share does not always lead to high profitability. There are also high costs involved with a high market share product. Growth share and relative market share are not the only indicators of profitability as well. This model ignores and overlooks other indicators of profitability because at times dogs may help other businesses in gaining competitive advantage. They can even earn more than cash cows. Finally, the four celled approach is considered to be too simplistic. Again, much like the SWOT, the BCG helps you get a lay of the land and is, greater, is a great icebreaker before a marketing meeting, but it cannot be considered viable enough for a full fledged corporate strategy formulation. That's it for this session on industry analysis. We hope you found the session useful and informative. Thank you. Let's summarize before we conclude this session. The SWOT analysis is a study undertaken by an organization or by consultants and investment bankers to identify a business's internal strengths and weaknesses as well as its external opportunities and threats. The PEST analysis, political, economic, social, cultural and technological analysis is a simple and widely used tool that helps you analyze the political, economic, social, cultural and technological changes in your business environment. The Boston Consulting Group's BCG product portfolio matrix is designed to help with long-term strategic planning and help a business consider growth opportunities by reviewing its portfolio of products to decide where to invest to discontinue or develop products.